right there, right there. Black belly up. This is the game. Yeah. It's a uh, cat and mouse. Smoked a turkey. <laughs> yes. He is down. He is freaking down. Said he shot an absolute giant. Phone session, baby. What's happening, everybody? Welcome back to another Fall Obsession podcast episode. Appreciate you guys tuning in. I am Sam Thrash with Fall Obsession, and I will be your host for this week's podcast. Really appreciate you guys tuning in, and if you are a new listener just now joining us, I definitely encourage you guys to go back and check out some of our previous week's episodes. Um, we have a lot of awesome content, literally been putting out a new podcast every single Monday morning um, for 40-something weeks now. Um, you don't have to start anywhere specific. You can pretty much jump jump in wherever you want. So I um, definitely encourage you guys to do that. But for this week, I am on the line with somebody who is not foreign to our podcast, and that is our marketing manager, Drew Tordick. Drew, welcome back, buddy. Hey, Sam. Thanks. It's good to be back. Yeah, man. Looking forward to, to talking with you today about some, uh, some of your hunts that you've had this year. Looks like you've uh, had a challenging yet a uh, somewhat rewarding season at all at the same time it's pretty awesome yeah it's not it hasn't been my most successful season as far as personal number of kills but it's definitely been a rewarding season as far as getting other people into hunting and sort of exploring some new country and being with friends that's awesome man well, before we uh, before we dive in any farther, I want to give a quick shout out to our friends over at Cinnamon Creek. Um, if you guys haven't uh, checked out Cinnamon Creek Archery here in the North Texas area, we encourage you guys to do so. Normally, we actually try to podcast from Cinnamon Creek. Um, today, I am actually sitting in my home office podcasting with Drew um, for this week's episode, but still encourage you guys to go check out Cinnamon Creek. They got an awesome pro shop down there. Good friends of ours. They got a wild game processor and event center. Um, they'll take care of you for whatever you need in regards to your archery needs or wild game processing. So um, follow them on Facebook, check them out online, and obviously if you're in the North Texas area, swing by and let them know that Fall Obsession sent you. So Drew, you had, well, I think we've talked about in a previous podcast about all the many opportunities you typically have or the, the man of many tags, you know, <laughs> as some yeah. might call you. But uh Tell us about going into the season, um, the opportunities that you kind of had on your plate um, as you were looking looking at your 2020 year. Sure. Uh, so heading into 2020, I was really looking forward to a backcountry uh, elk hunt that we do pretty early uh, in September. Um, that's me, and it's usually I go have been going with an outfitter, but this year for the first time I decided to go with a group of friends, uh, some people kind of convinced me that it was something they wanted to do and they were willing to put in the work and the effort to get back there. And so that's what we did. Uh, spent the summer preparing for that trip and went out there and unfortunately only saw one elk the entire time we were out there and it was pretty far away. Uh, so didn't really get a good chance at those, uh, but it was definitely a good time, uh, fun to get out and see some new country uh just based on some of the weather and some of the reports that we were hearing we went into a different area than i've ever hunted and uh it was kind of interesting to find some new areas to hunt yeah for sure what uh was the weather any different this year compared to previous years or or what would you attribute the the limited numbers that you saw this year to uh, i think a lot of it actually had to do with the wildfires and the smoke okay and the was really limited so we'd get up to the glassing spots and instead of being able to see three or four miles it was limited to less than a mile at a lot of the points mm. and that really makes it difficult when you're trying to spot and stock hunt especially in some pretty wide open country yeah absolutely so you had the you had the elk trip what what followed that would the rest of the year look like for you yeah absolutely so after that elk trip uh came back made plans to go back out there since we hadn't filled any tags uh a good friend of mine cody actually uh put us in contact with some people out there and we were able to sort of get some inside knowledge on some land that although it was only cows only uh 
definitely had a high probability of us being able to shoot some elk. Uh, had a really good trip in there. Uh, wasn't a huge piece of property that we were hunting, so we were essentially hunting, um, hiking out from the truck every day, which was nice compared to backcountry hunting. But uh, happened to see quite a few elk. Had one probably 35 yards in the uh, in the timber opening morning. Um, yeah, had a lot of opportunities. Got in close to a herd. Um, got some shooting. I didn't get one. Uh, my buddy got one. And some guys that we met out there happened to get one as well. Actually, they got what, three. So we helped them gut those and get them in the truck. And yeah, it was, it was a fun trip. Uh, I also went out there for a pronghorn trip. So we just kind of tail ended that elk trip right into pronghorn hunting and was able to, uh, get my good friend, Sam Burroughs, a, uh, his first pronghorn antelope. Awesome, man. And uh, for our listeners who might not have seen it, that uh, you were able to get that hunt on video as well, or at least a portion of that trip. And uh, that's on, now on our uh, website and our YouTube page. Um, I think we published it last week at the time of this episode coming out, so um, you guys can go back and check that out. Um, I believe it's titled uh, Montana Speed Goat Spot and Stock or something like that. So um, y'all be sure you go check out the video too. It's a pretty cool hunt from from what i could see so yeah and we, we've talked about this in previous podcasts but it's definitely a case of knowing the right place to go and having been somewhere before and knowing where the animals hang out i mean that was a spot that i'd taken you and you and chester and you know we'd been out there and been to those locations and seen those areas before and it it has an advantage for sure to be able to kind of know the area know where the animals are and it, it it benefit us for sure that time man i was gonna tell you too after after i saw the video for the first time i was like man that that looks kind of familiar <laughs> i feel like <laughs> i feel like i've been there or around there um on before it looked like familiar territory <laughs> yeah it was it was funny actually uh so if you go back and you watch what is it uh, you know, fall obsessed outdoors season what two season. or three where we were out there with Chester? Uh, actually, is the most recent one that we had. So chapter four um, would be the oh, chapter, one with yep. Chester. Yeah. Yep. So if you go back and look at that one, I was actually sitting on the hill where Chester made that shot on that antelope and glassing from up there, talking to my friend on the phone and just you know had had to had to let him go once I saw those antelope and we quick ran down and made a play on him yeah that's awesome man yeah guys for for those of you who are new follower haven't seen all of our videos so last year a little bit of background um last year drew myself and another good friend of ours chester barnes um all three of us were up there on a hunt unfortunately after a week um, we were unsuccessful but it still made for an awesome trip some awesome video some awesome footage um and we've we have a, our hunting series, our online hunting series, Fall Obsessed Outdoors. Chapter 4 is uh, at least one episode is the story of that hunt. And then we've also podcasted a few times about our uh, about our Montana trips over the years and everything like that, including the, the year before where um, I was able to put one on the ground with my bow. So all that, all that stuff's on our pages, our YouTube, our podcast. So um, if you guys want more details on kind of, where we were at before this year you can definitely go check them out and get brought to speed for sure but so he got a he got a, his first pronghorn buck what about you do you get to fill your pronghorn tags yeah so i had an either sex tag and i honestly wasn't picky about uh really trying to get a trophy this season um just with all the tags that i had i was just looking to fill one and one of the mornings when we were out hiking around we came over the knob and we were probably about 30 yards from two or three 
antelope. Actually, it started off, we pulled in the gate, and we could see them. So we kind of spotted spotted them and kind of worked our way in and were able to sneak within 30 yards by utilizing the terrain to get in close to them. And the plan was to pop up over the hill and shoot. And the two guys who I was trying to get their first antelope, we popped up over the hill and neither one of them shot. And the antelope turned and were running away. And so I took my shot at one and was able to take it. And so filled my tag early on and then was able to just focus on helping those guys get their antelope. That's awesome. Yeah, you, uh, you got to take the shot opportunities when you have them, that's for sure. I've learned that the hard way a couple times. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So pronghorns are on the ground. Elk season's kind of getting to be behind you. Um, but then I also, I, I know we were all pretty impressed when you sent out the text message with the whitetail that you killed this year too. So kind of take us into that a little bit and kind of set the stage for us on uh, on how that came about and how that transpired. Definitely. So I was out um, elk hunting and we were hunting that herd of elk that I said that we had found and you know, this herd happens to spend a majority of its time on private land and kind of filters into the public every now and then. And you're able to get some shots at it, some opportunities. Um, but we were lucky enough to be able to get permission on a chunk of block management land uh, that was real close by that public land where we'd been seeing the elk. So we were hiking around in there hoping to find some elk and stumbled upon a really nice whitetail buck and so um yeah it was it was great uh it started off actually pretty uneventful we were hiking through looking for these elk and happened to have seen just a whitetail doe sleeping on the trail and we stood there and watched her for 10 or 15 minutes and talked between us and neither one of us wanted to uh hollow a doe that far out so we're just going to pass on it and let it go and so we just walked toward it and as it bumped out of there we noticed that it was with two really nice bucks uh i only saw one of them but according to my friend cody one of them was a really nice drop time Uh, so there was two really nice bucks in there with those those and was able to follow the tracks in the fresh snow and sort of track it through the glades probably about 400 yards before I was able to get a shot, I'd get in close and it would snort and run off and finally got in and about 35 yards from it and had a nice shot and was able to take it. So awesome. Was that, is that your first whitetail in Montana? That is my first Montana whitetail buck. And according to the landowner that we got the permission from, uh, it was, one of his target bucks for the year so we're pretty confident that it was one of the bigger bucks on the property and that's always rewarding to be able to you know capture a fully mature animal yeah absolutely so you mentioned the landowner um are are you hunting private land or or public or a combination of all of them how how was the how was the setup this year yeah so for the elk hunting, we were doing a lot of hunting on public land. Uh, but then additionally in Montana, they have this really great program called block management. And the block management program is uh, a bunch of landowners who have decided that they're going to allow hunting and fishing and trapping in some cases on their land in exchange for certain privileges and certain financial contributions from the state in Montana, uh, which is paid for by out of state license. And so we were able to register with this block management for this property owner and get permission on this property. And we definitely found some elk in there and, uh, was able to sit and glass up a group of six elk, uh, just on the other side of the fence in land that we couldn't hunt. Uh, but, we were probably 40 yards from the elk and 
you know, pretty close to being able to fill our tag that day. And it's a really nice opportunity in Montana to be able to hunt some of these private land parcels that sort of connect to public land. And that's really what they focus on is um, trying to bring in properties that expand that hunting opportunity. Yeah. Man, that that's really cool. I know... I know that something like that would not uh would probably not be as as well received on the landowner portion down here in a place like Texas. So <laughs> Yeah. That's that's awesome that they can do that up there. Yeah, and the landowner was really great too. Uh we called him and told him that we shot or that I'd shot that buck and he was gonna drive out there for us and help us drag it out of the woods, but we'd already got it in the truck at that point, but you know, he encouraged us to come stop by the house, and we sat and talked with him for quite a while. Uh, so, I mean, they're excited to have hunters out there. It's something that they're they're uh, more than welcoming to anyone out there. Uh, it's kind of an interesting deal. So, so how did you get in touch with him specifically? Was it just something that you look up online specific to the area that you're hunting, or does does the state a lot you certain places to go or kind of look at the draw how's that work yeah so there's two types of block management units there's ones where they're open to the public and all you need to do is show up and sign in at a box and there are ones that are private reservations and so you need to get in touch with the landowner and make reservations for specific days and times to come out and hunt i know the property we were on was limited to 10 people and so they just kind of make sure there's not too many people in there hunting for the day. Gotcha. So that's, uh, um, and again, I'm speculating, but I, I guess that's a, a place and a, a landowner that you could probably go back and, and hunt with in a future season again. Oh, absolutely. And I'm, I'm not going to mention the exact ranch name out there, right. but it was, it was really nice. Um, just to see how welcoming they were to out-of-state hunters and how willing they were to, you know, just open up their property and their ranch to anybody. Uh, I mean, anybody listening to this podcast could go out and find that ranch uh, and go out there and hunt it. And that's kind of it's kind of a great addition to public lands. It's it's not it's not officially public land, but it, it's public land hunting for sure. Yeah. Man, that's awesome. Re- really cool program, I think. So for for this season, I know you're, you know, we're, we've talked about, or we've touched on the elk, the pronghorn, the whitetail. Um, and I know in regards to actual gear, equipment, setup, stuff like that, in our, the last time you were on with us, we did an episode on uh, back, oh, actually two episodes, backcountry elk and then backcountry camp, where you go a little bit, deeper into you know your backcountry elk experience and what all goes into it and stuff like that i encourage guys to go back and listen to those two episodes um, because they are really good but um, with that being said what kind of gear and equipment were you running this year what kind of and and your rifle setup too i was curious about that oh man uh so i guess there's so many details of that elk hunting trip that we haven't covered yet that it it we can get into it it's it was a pretty crazy trip actually um kind of made some decisions last minute to upgrade some of my gear and ended up accidentally double packing and so i brought in oh, more man. gear after after all that talk about trying to pack light and trying to be lightweight and be able to go far distances and stuff like that i i definitely overpacked and ended up quite literally with two sets of everything that I needed. Um, so I didn't realize it until I was already seven miles from the truck. <laughs> <laughs> and so I ended up carrying more stuff than I needed to all week, uh, which definitely impacted my mobility. Uh, but, you know, I was prepared, I guess. In case, in case it got nasty. Uh, but one thing, I mean, we had talked in our previous episode about how important that Garmin inReach was and mm-hmm. was going to be for us, uh, just being out of cell phone service and being in an area with grizzly bears and 
you know, what happens if something goes wrong and somebody needs medical attention. And I, I'm not exaggerating on this trip, on this story. Uh, we, we pulled into the trailhead and as we pulled in, we watched, uh, some horses get out of control and kick a guy and then watch him fall over and kind of lay there on the hillside. Oh man. You know, the next thing we know, we're getting out and helping and finding out if they need medical help. And, you know, those Garmin inreach came in play because we didn't have cell phone service at that point. And we actually had to end up using it to call in the medical helicopter. And so I've got video that we can post um, but yeah, our trip into the mountains started with a medical evacuation before oh, we ever wow. put our backpacks on. I didn't even know that. That is crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And it ended up being an outfitter in the area that we hunt, uh, who had been on 50 plus years worth of outfitting trips and never had an issue before. And this was his going to be before this happened his last trip out into the mountains uh to hunt uh i think they were hunting sheep uh so his last trip got cut short but luckily we were able to get him some medical attention and get him out of there wow that that is crazy you you hear and speaking for myself you know i i hear stories and see videos and and stuff you know hear about stuff like that happening um but, but man, I, I can only imagine that, you know, when it's actually happening in front of your eyes, you know, it's a little surreal. <laughs> yeah, it, it was kind of, it wasn't what I was expecting, you know, yeah. I pull, and I, I see this guy and we still had the radio on in the car, but I saw him fall. I didn't see him get kicked, but I saw him fall and I saw him sit up and I saw him mouth the words, I think my leg is broken. <laughs> and I was like, you know, I looked at my buddy and I said, I- I'm pretty sure that garden is going to come in handy. And then uh, we got out and helped him. But yeah, it, it, it really hit home for all the guys that w- this was their first trip about why that was an important tool and, yeah, you know, how, how quickly things can go wrong when you're out of communication with the rest of the world. Uh, luckily the fire, the search and rescue team, whatever you want to call them that come out of cook city, in Montana, those guys do a great job. Uh, shout out to them, and they were able to sort of help that helicopter in and get that guy out of there really quick. Very good. Well, um, I guess one thing that I do want to say, and we've confirmed this after a couple calls and talking to some people, but there were some people walking by that had the Garmin in reach but weren't going to use it because they were afraid that they were going to get charged directly to their Garmin account or whatever it is and so just anybody that has one of those don't be afraid to use it you're not going to get charged by calling in the life light the medical stuff um, I mean obviously the person who's injured is going to have to deal with those bills but you as the person with that piece of safety equipment you're not going to see any bills from that so don't be afraid to use them very good to know um, and a very useful piece of equipment for sure so the Garmin in reach definitely recommend. Uh, other than packing everything twice, what el- what else do you have with you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, other than packing everything in twice, um, I had my tent. You know that seek outside tent with the wood stove mm-hmm. uh, came in really nice. It was able to uh, kind of fend off the cold on a couple of those mornings, but. We were lucky. It was really nice weather for the most part. I didn't end up needing that. It didn't rain. It was pretty dry. Uh, so that was nice. I was carrying my um, Mystery Ranch pack that I had brought in there for the last three years. That thing is great. I love it. Uh, it's finally getting nice and broken. It feels really comfortable. Uh, let see. What else did I have? Oh, my Browning x Pro Long Range. Um Love that gun. It's super lightweight. It's got the carbon fiber stock, uh, the full Cerakote, so you don't have to worry about it in the weather. Uh, Pretty nice. Um, Other than that, I mean, we're carrying really lightweight stuff this year. Uh, I had my baby sack, my, uh, what, 
outdoor research helium bivy that i use uh really like that as far as keeping your bag waterproof even in the tent um sometimes you get that condensation dripping down and it's just nice to have that to help keep your sleeping bag dry uh yeah as far as the equipment goes i tried to stay pretty light this year so i didn't bring a ton of it in what uh what's your firearm set up this year yeah it's that seven millimeter rem mag so shooting that um pretty comfortable with it out to around 400 500 yards somewhere in there um yeah depending on conditions uh this year i had a shot it was 400 yards uh we went in as a group and a bunch of guys were shooting and the elk that I picked out was kind of behind a hill and hindsight being what it is. I wish I would have just picked a different one to shoot at. <laughs> so I wasn't, wasn't able to take mine down, but the other guys in the group were. Gotcha. <laughs> well, very cool. So any other interesting hunts or cool stories or anything from this season that we haven't talked about so far? You know, I guess there is one. Uh, I don't know if I've talked to you about this even. Uh, my buddy Cody and I were out in Montana, and those anybody who hunted Montana opening weekend will tell you this year was pretty brutal. Uh, they had a pretty bad blizzard go through, and so getting around in some of those backcountry forest roads were really, really difficult. And, you know, I've got a truck that, for the most part is pretty well equipped um has never really let me down as far as getting stuck i mean besides that time when it broke when i was out with chester. <laughs> i was gonna say if chester barnes is listening to this right now he is gonna be yelling at you <laughs> uh, this, one, this one is less the truck's fault and more my own fault and so we we had made it pretty far out there and you know never even had to put it in a four-wheel drive and rounded this one corner and realize that all the tracks kind of stopped but didn't realize until we were halfway up this kind of backcountry switchback that that was the case and next thing you know the truck was kind of sitting sideways and it was a pretty steep drop off to the one side Ooh. Um, so we were doing everything we can to get it back on the road and i mean had chains on was using winches and come alongs and snap to come along and we're just starting to try and really figure out how we were going to get the truck out of there without sending it off the side of this hill when this guy happened to come along uh, and had all the necessary winch and block and tackle and everything that he needed to be able to really pull us around and get us back on the road and get us out of that pretty sticky situation. So, gotcha. uh, yeah, shout out to Kenny. And if you're listening to this, that was awesome. Uh, otherwise we'd probably still be stuck there <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's uh it's nice when when somebody comes along and and can help you out like that and they've been there and done that and have the right stuff to get get you out so yeah it's just one of those things where i mean we've all been stuck in the back country and sometimes it's you and sometimes it's the other guy and so it's just nice to have somebody come along and be able to help you or you be able to help them and i mean it's funny how things work the the next day, literally the next day we were at a different spot hunting and we came across two guys who had pretty much buried their truck. Uh, and so we were able to pull them out. And so, you know, just kind of, it all goes around. Yeah. Very cool. I'm glad, uh, glad you didn't throw yourself or your pickup off the side of a mountain. Yeah, no, it was, it was close. <laughs> it was closer than I want to be again anytime soon. Uh, yeah, I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> so all these experiences and, and this season, you know, eat, we're, we're talking about success and, and or the success you had and the memorable experiences from this year. Uh, I know, I know there's a lot of, a lot of trial and frustration that also came with this season. Uh, you said at the beginning, you know, it, 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 it hadn't been your best, your best year hunting. Um, but what's, what's your biggest takeaway from this year? you think, um, everything combined. 
my biggest takeaway this year. I guess it's just that, you know, you need to be in the field to be able to, to shoot deer. And, I mean, that sounds pretty cliche and stuff, but with all that I had going on, I wasn't able to spend nearly the amount of time in the woods that I have in the past. And it definitely had an impact. Um, you know, when you're feeling rushed because you've got anything going on and you're, you know, less focused on hunting or less focused on the amount of time that you can put out there, um, it really affects being able to hunt. You get what you put in, for sure. You get what you put in, yeah. Yeah, that's a good way of saying it. Um, yeah, it's definitely something that I am going to put some thought into in future years. Uh, you know, how how thinly do I try and spread myself across different states and different hunts and things like that versus yeah. really being selective and, you know, finding something that individually – um, sort of is just as rewarding as all of these other hunts combined. Yeah. Um, one of the things I've thought about is, you know, it's right about now is the time you need to be applying for that Alaska moose hunt or any of those Alaska hunts. I think their deadline is in January. So yeah, I think that's something I'm considering that's kind of a bucket list hunt for me. So maybe doing one really big hunt next year might be something for me to just kind of really focus on one thing. Yeah. And it's funny you say that because I think I actually had something pop up on my instagram or something today about that alaska deadline too so it's funny you mentioned that and and also this i mean this is pretty much segueing into the next bullet point that i have here and and that was um what your intentions were or at least looking right now i know it's early but looking right now to next year you know because you know we call you the man of many tags but you know what uh what if anything you were going to do differently in 2021 in 2021, so I'm definitely applying for the bull elk tag in this region that we discovered. Um, and there was a lot of elk in there. There was a lot of really nice bulls. I know that it's sort of limited draw, but I also know that out of state kind of has an advantage in some of those limited draw entries. So I'm going to put in for that. Um, just definitely putting in for either some sort of you know alaska moose or some big hunt uh it would be a lot of fun to sort of get out and do something that's been outside of my comfort zone outside of something that i've done before and just sort of have that new experience absolutely well man i appreciate you jumping on here with me i know we're uh we're on the shorter end of the time we normally shoot for but it's been uh it's been good to talk with you catch up and and get the story on on this year i know i know the season's not even really 100 percent over yet you know we're kind of in the home stretch but um some, for some guys it's over and for some guys they're still going but it's been awesome to hear about what you what you've had so far yeah it's it's a lot of fun uh it's nice to talk to you about this. I know. Uh, I know. Next year, old. If you're not a, uh, if you're not up in the back country of Alaska, I guess old Nick Powell and I would like to come up there and try to stick a couple pronghorns with you. Give that another shot. <laughs> yeah, we should definitely do that. Looking forward to it. Well, guys, um, appreciate you you all listening to another Fall Obsession podcast episode. If you guys have not already. You know the drill. Go follow and subscribe. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. We have a YouTube channel. Um, and then all of our content obviously filters through them and fallobsession.com. That is our website and the hub. That's where you can find everything for going back uh, several years in regards to the content that we've produced. Um, and hit that follow and subscribe button for this podcast. We're on all the major podcast apps, wherever you guys listen, um, we should be there. So, um, we appreciate you guys tune in. We, like I said, at the beginning, we dropped a drop another episode every Monday morning. So you guys can, uh, can tune in get that notification every time we, we publish a new one. And also, if you guys have any feedback on our podcast, fallobsession.com slash podcast on our website, you can go there and, uh, there's a form you can fill out to either, 
suggest a topic, ask a question, or just provide general feedback. And we'd be happy to see what you got and see how we can possibly incorporate into a future episode. So we love getting feedback on our podcast. But be sure you guys do that and also pick up some apparel from our online store, fallobsession.com. We got some new designs that have dropped recently, so um, some fresh merch on there that you guys can go check out. Drew, thanks again, buddy. I appreciate it. Yeah, anytime. All right, guys, and we will see you all next week for another episode of our Fall Obsession podcast, and I will encourage you guys to tune in in the weeks to come because we have some awesome guests joining us here in these next few episodes. Um, Very entertaining and very informative, so you guys be sure to tune in. We'll catch you later. Later.